Our goal in lossy compression is to throw information away. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about ways to throw things away. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about a way of doing coordinate transformations that make it really easy to relegate certain details of an image to a certain part of the transformed data to make it really easy to throw it out. But before then, we need to talk a bit about some more perceptual issues. So this lecture is on something called subsampling, and it's, it's actually, the term doesn't really make any sense in the context of digital images because of what we're describing ultimately amounts to downscaling images, changing the resolution. Um, we'll see that there's a lot of cases where um, terminology out of signal processing shows up uh, a lot in the discussion of digital images um, and in the discussion of compression techniques because often it, it comes out of um, signal processing and things like discrete cosine transforms uh, come out of the domain of, of, um, of analog signals. So uh, here we have this image again, a color image. And of course, it's actually um, each pixel stores three color samples. And really, then we can think about it like three separate images, um, red, green, and blue. So I'm going to refer to these things as, as um, I'm gonna, my mouse isn't working properly. Uh, Maybe it is now. Okay, that looks good. Um, so uh, I'm going to refer to these things as color planes. So if I have an image with um, red, green, and blue components for every pixel, what I really have are three images that are overlaid on top of each other. The red component, the green component, and the blue component. The red, green, and blue color planes. Um, so I can view a red, green, an RGB image as three separate images. And it's no surprise that on this particular image, which as we saw last time is of course full of different shades of green, that a lot of de we seem to see a huge amount of detail showing up in just the green channel. Whereas there aren't very many blues in the image, and so remember that um, a darker value in these grayscale representations means lower value for that component. So there aren't very, we're seeing only very slight shades of blue and everything. And although there are lots of reds, if you look at, for example, the detail of the pair in the red channel versus the green one, we, we actually observe more detail in the green channel. Um, and so the, the issue we had last time was that we saw lots of ways of throwing out information. I could just reduce the number of pixels. I mean, I, I could just cut the image in half and just store half of the pixels. The problem is, if I do that, we notice pixelation, sort of the, the obvious consequence of removing resolution. So the question is, if I look at each color separately, is there something I can do? Now, some of the techniques we described last time, we could apply to each color separately. So that example of scalar quantization, we could always store the green channel in eight bits and the red and blue channels in four. That's, all, that's an option. Um, we saw, though, that color quantization has a lot of disadvantages that we generally can't get around. So the biggest one being, if we quantize the red channel into four bits and the green channel stays at eight, that's great for this image. But what about images full of red? So what's interesting about human vision, and this, the fact this image is all green is actually coincidence, but what's interesting about human vision is that our visual system is very good at picking out details in shades of green. We are very sensitive to green um, over other colors. And the, uh, my understanding, at least, is that that's because of evolutionary reasons, which is that we, green um, is the color of, of things like plants, and we might want to eat plants, whereas we don't tend to need to differentiate different shades of blue as much for evolutionary reasons. Um, and so as a result, our eyes are more sensitive to greens. Our eyes, of course, are also much more sensitive to changes in luminance, which would be, um, I guess, uh, Colloquially speaking, things like brightness. Um, so brightness changes luminance over chrominance, which would be color. Um, and that's because our um, optical system, our, our vision system, actually uses two different types of receptors, so the rods and cones on your retina, where there are actually a great deal more rods, which, which uh, receive um, changes in brightness. So our eyes are much more sensitive to brightness changes than they are to any type of color. But among colors, we're far more sensitive to the color green. So if that's the case, then logically, we might be able to sacrifice more detail. First off, we can sacrifice more detail in color than we can in brightness. And we can sacrifice more detail in, let's say, blue than we can in green, because our eyes are less likely to notice changes in blue than they are changes in green. So I could try this. I could say, wait a minute. If our eyes are really good at noticing green versus other colors, why don't I scale the three different planes differently? I'll keep the green channel at full resolution, but I will cut the resolution of red and blue. 
and I'll transmit three different color planes at different resolutions, and then you, the decompressor, will put them back together. It'll, it'll enlarge the red and blue planes back up to their original size, and then um, uh, sort of merge them back together into, into a, a single color image. So an example being, I could store the, uh, the green plane in full resolution, and I could store the red and blue planes in um, significantly smaller resolutions. That would be, what, 1 16th the original resolution. So I cut it, uh, I, I quarter the resolution in both dimensions. And then when I want to view the complete image, I just scale the red and blue planes back up, and then I, I uh, reconstruct the original image from that. So this is called um, subsampling. And what we're getting at here, although this is not a good application of it, is called chroma subsampling. This is subsampling that's been employed deliberately for the sake of reducing color resolution. And um, I don't think I have a, I'm not sure if I have a close-up of this, but if we take a look at the subsampled thing, so this is where I've stored the green channel in full resolution, and I've stored the um, uh, red and blue channel in one-third, so I, I've cut down their resolution by one th to one-third of its original value in both vertical and, and horizontal dimensions. And I look at the reconstructed image, and it looks really good. Uh, but maybe that's just because the image was full of green to begin with. Um, and so to be very careful about this, obviously, uh, the subsampling doesn't degrade quality. Even though I've saved a whole ton of space, I've reduced the, the, the size of, I've taken two-thirds of the image out and then reduced that two-thirds to one-ninth of its previous resolution. And I've reconstructed it and gotten a high-detail image. So this has worked pretty well. But of course, the green layer seems to have all the detail in this image anyway. So we should be a little bit careful about this. So there's the image. I guess I do have a close-up. There's the image, um, and there's the result of doing this subsampling. Um, and what I will call your attention to, so as I said last time, pull up the slides on the side and look at them just in case the video compression is doing something to this lecture. Um, take a look at this region and this region. So green, the green part of each pixel is staying at its full resolution. The red and blue part of each pixel is being, is being downscaled. I'm, I'm reducing the resolution. And that means that a, a green pixel, this is of course an exaggeration, um, a green pixel might be this size, but each red pixel might be, will be like this, right? So a green pixel would be one ninth the size of a red pixel. I don't know where it would be lined up, um, but as a result, uh, we might notice some artifacts that show up specifically on boundaries between regions of distinct color. And this is such a boundary. So we've got this nice green area and then what goes to white and a darker green. Here's the subsampled image. And if you take a look over here, you notice that there's some, you might notice some funny looking, almost pixelation like artifacts, but the pixelation will have this strange um, discoloration. And if you look very closely at this boundary here, you might notice that there's a sort of sawtooth pattern forming where there are little chunks of red showing up, uh, sort of um, pointing outwards from the pair and there are little chunks of green pointing towards the pair. And that's the mismatch between the square, uh, the larger square blue and red pixels and the smaller square green pixels. So this sort of blocky artifact that we get is a result of chroma subsampling. Now it's much more obvious, oh actually we can see some of it over here as well. If you zoom in on this area, you will notice that there, is some, there are some funny purplish sort of magenta and bright greenish areas um, sort of going in and out of the leaf and the area behind it. Um, here's the result of if I, I leave the red and blue planes at full resolution and I scale down the green plane. Now to be clear, if I go back and look at this, this image here, I have, I have removed um, eight ninths of the resolution of two of the three color planes. So in this image, I'm keeping one color plane at full resolution and scaling the other two down by to one third of their previous resolution in both dimensions. So two color planes get scaled down dramatically. In this image, I scale only one color plane. This image requires more storage by, like, in an uncompressed setting, more storage than the previous one. And even without having to zoom in on it, you will notice that you perceive a significant difference in quality. This one looks like I scaled down the whole image. It, it looks like it's fully pixelated. The detail level here is sort of awful. It looks very pixelated. I can see very pixelated boundaries on the edges of the pair, even though this image is bigger. It, it contains more information, more color information than this one, where I was able to, to significantly significantly cut down the red and blue components and still retained a perceived high level of detail in green. 
And that's both because the image is full of greens, but also because our visual system is much more attuned to differences in the green channel. So here's this, the fruit salad again. Um, here's what happens if I scale the red and blue planes. And let's go looking for the funny discoloration artifacts. Um, I might be able to see a couple of them. Um, there are some visible on the side of this blue beer. I want to see if I can find some brighter colored ones to point out. Um, it's generally hard to see them because if there's lots of different colors, oh yeah, there's some there. If you zoom in on that, you can see some strange bright green and bright pink um, discolorations forming. Um, there actually are artifacts happening here, but they're not very noticeable because they're on a green boundary. And I, I don't know if I can see any obvious ones visible from um, at the resolution I have. Th these over here, the pomegranate arils, which is the formal term for a pomegranate seed. The pomegranate arils do have um, uh, artifacts on them, but it might not be obvious to people that aren't used to looking for that kind of artifact because it could just be mistaken as reflections. So actually, we're getting, there's very few visible artifacts in this image. Um, and here's the version of the image where I've scaled down only the green plane. And the, the image isn't full of, I mean, it's got greens, but it doesn't have that many. And if you compare these two, at best, they're the same quality. Um, but I would say that, that um, you can actually detect certain, uh, I would look at the pixelation around this, uh, this particular pomegranate seed here. Take a look at the pixelation of this compared to the previous slide. Even though I'm cutting down only the green channel and this area I've just circled doesn't actually contain anything that looks green, this looks um, like it has worse quality in the image that contains more information. And I hope that that's enough to prove to you, and maybe zoom in on the image more in the slides you have, I hope that's enough to prove to you that chroma subsampling is a really useful way of throwing away information that we don't need. So, um, the actual space consumption, if I do this, if I scale it, <clears throat> if I scale down both red and blue, I end up getting down to 40% of my original resolution. And as I said, it's, we can go find artifacts. They exist. I've, I've removed more than half of the information in this image, and there are artifacts, but they're very difficult to detect. You could do a difference. You could take a difference of the two images um, programmatically, but a human observer would have difficulty, unless they knew to go looking for chroma subsampling artifacts, finding any here. Um, so I've already gotten to 40% of my original space. And uh, if I reduce the two color planes, um, red and blue, by a factor of 5, so they go down to 25% of their original resolution um, in both dimensions, uh, or sorry, 20%, um, then I get this. Now, actually, maybe I have, do I have a, this is the one I, I was missing a close-up of. If you zoom in on this, you can, you'll notice here and here, pretty obvious, it might even be visible without zooming in, pretty obvious artifacts. There's something funny going on with bits of bright green and bright pink there. <clears throat> and that's the result of the subsampling of the overlapping pixels not properly lining up with the boundary of a region. So if I have a region defined like this, where there's one side and then there's the other, um, originally, my region was carefully delineated by tiny little pixels, which of course direct, which you know, um, uh, clearly defined the boundary of the region. But now what I have is some of the pixels of the color planes I've scaled down are large. And so this color, of course, this pixel in the red channel is now one color. And so the color bleeds between um, the two regions. And because the pixels are square, we, we see that as this sort of jagged color bleeding that occurs. Um, and here, if I scale down the colors, uh, the red and blue channels, by to one-fifth of their original resolution um, in this image, color artifacts are also more visible. They're less obvious because there's lots of reflections in this image, and some of them can be mistaken for funny reflections. Um, if I were to go looking for them, I would probably um, pick these ones. A bright area is the easiest place to see them. If you zoom in, you will again see the telltale bright green and bright pink. Um, which is which is the way that these manifest with red, green, and blue subsampling. Um, but that's getting us down to 36% of our original size, and it's still re retaining a very high quality image. Now, um, if I'm keeping, if I've got three color channels, and I keep one of the planes at the full original resolution, well, obviously that was a third of the res that was a third of the size. One color plane in the uncompressed image is one third of the size of the image. So that means if I keep one color plane at the original resolution, no amount of scaling of the other two color planes could ever get me below 33% of my original size. Um, I sort of I can asymptotically approach that, but if I keep one color plane at full resolution, I have no other choice. I have to only approach 33%. 
we saw already that we want to get down to, I don't know, 1%, 10% of our original size and still retain quality. That's, that's what JPEG can give us. Now, JPEG is the result of lots of techniques, including subsampling, um, as well as something called the discrete cosine transform that we'll talk about next time, and Huffman coding and differential encoding. But we want, to get, we want to see if we can do better than 33%. But if we can't, I would like to be able to scale down these red and blue channels or whatever other color channels are less important by as much as possible. Um, and in this case, the green layer, because our visual system is so good with greens, the green layer preserves a lot of detail for, from the point of view of our perception. If we delete detail from blue and red, we don't notice the difference because our visual system is only picking up details provided to us by the green layer. Um, but eventually, I will see these weird blocky artifacts visible as color bleeding between two regions, usually. So I see that here, I see that here. There's something that looks like pixelation happening here, but, but in general, I'm seeing the same. And again, it's always bright green and bright pink when we're working with this, when we're scaling down the red and blue color planes um, there. And I, I'm not actually seeing too many artifacts down at the bottom. To be honest, I, I'm maybe not. It's because the, there's lots of greens there, and so the difference between colors in terms of their red and blue shades isn't very significant. Here I've scaled down the red and blue planes by a factor of 10. Even without zooming in, you can see really weird stuff happening around boundaries. Um, really obvious cases where you can see that the square red and blue pixels don't are don't line up properly with boundaries of regions, and so they they overlap the boundary and, and result in these funny jagged blocky artifacts. Now, if the image isn't really green, as this one was, so even in the really bad case, this image doesn't have artifacts happening down here because we're transitioning between two shades of green. This image isn't very green. And if I try scaling down the color planes here, it looks as if this area, which is full of red, is just pixelated. I, I, the green channel can't repair the damage done to the detail by the lack of the red channel there. Although I have really butchered the red and blue channel. I mean, I, I have taken out a ton of information from red and blue before I got to this point. Um, and you can see there that piece of melon no longer looks very appetizing. I have the obvious artifacts around the pieces of pineapple here because that's a transition between bright and dark where the artifacts are more likely to show up. Down here it looks pixelated. So the problem is I want to preserve as much detail as possible and I want to throw away color information that I can't see. To be clear, all of the artifacts I just circled aren't for lack of color, they're for lack of detail. If the, the general color of each region, so starting with the pomegranate arrows, this area here is still the right color. And what draws my attention to it isn't the color, it's the fact that inside of the region, everything looks really pixelated. What I want to do is, maybe this is a sign that I don't actually have a problem with how red this is. It's not the amount of red, it's the fact that there's that red channel of RGB does contain other detail, dark versus light. And I need that to be preserved because my visual system does detect the absence of the dark versus light detail, even though it is about as red as I expect it to be. Now the reason, ultimately what I'm getting to here, is that RGB isn't really a good choice for the kind of work that we want to do. I want to break the image up into color planes, not by primary colors. I mean, RGB is used because it works well for monitors, basically. Um, I want to break the image up into color planes uh, based on the bias of the human visual system. For example, I want green to be important. I want red and blue to be less important. But I want detail, so brightness, luminance, to be the most important. I want to, basically, I want to use a different coordinate system. The same way that when you're, you're working with some types of things mathematically, there are cases where Euclidean coordinates, so I mean, here's my x-axis and my y-axis, where I look at a point and um, you know, there's its, there's its x coordinate and there's its y coordinate. There are cases where this coordinate system makes sense, but there are also cases where um, the coordinate system I want is actually uh, polar coordinates. So there's r and there's theta, or actually maybe r should be the length of this. So I can refer to a point as being x comma y, I can refer to it as being r comma theta and polar coordinates. Both can re The same set of points can be represented in both cases, but there are uses for polar coordinates. For example, rotating a point in polar coordinates is easy. If I want to rotate a point around by a certain angle, all I do is add something to theta. That's a single addition. That makes it really easy. Um, and uh, scaling a point with um, 
I guess is easy in both cases. It's sort of easier in polar coordinates, but I can multiply it by something in, in um, Euclidean coordinates. On the other hand, shifting a point, so moving the point over by two to the left or something, is easier in Euclidean coordinates, it's, or in, in, sorry, in Cartesian coordinates. Um, the idea basically is that a coordinate change can help isolate the details that we care about. Uh, and we'll see in the next lecture that we can harness that even further with general coordinate transformations of our pixels, regardless of their color values, even in black and white images. But for the time being, we want to find a different way of representing colors. We've got three components per pixel. Right now it's red, green, and blue. What if I choose different components? Maybe I can choose components such that if I subsample certain color planes, I can go much to, to a much lower resolution before I begin losing perceived detail. So here's my original image. Here's just the, the, a wrap up of, so here's uh, scaling down red and blue heavily. I get severe um, jagged blocky artifacts on the edges of regions. And here is where I've now, okay, just to reinforce the point that the green channel holds lots of information. Here I've scaled down red and blue by to 10% of their original value. So to be clear, the green channel is still this big. The red and blue channels occupy about this much total, this many total pixels in the original image. That's how small I've made the red and blue channels. That's how much detail they still have. And yet, if you showed me this, I'd say that's a bad JPEG of a picture of a pear hanging off of a tree. It, look, it looks like a bad JPEG. I can see the artifacts, but I know what it is. Here is the result of scaling only the green channel. I keep the red and blue at full resolution and I scale only the green channel. Now you hand me this and I would say this looks like slide 28 of my subsampling lecture because I wasn't born yesterday or anything. But I'd say if it's not that, maybe this is some weird attempt at stained glass or a frame from a 90s video game or something like that. Um, it's, it looks obviously pixelated, obviously low detail, even though this actually objectively has the same amount of detail, um, or sorry, has more detail than this previous image. Because our visual system is so good with green, um, we can really put up with a, lot, a loss of detail in the uh, in the other channels a lot. So let's do the same thing with the fruit salad, where the, the difference will be less stark. Here I subsample red and blue by ten, to 10%. So red and blue now occupy about this much um, of the original image. And I get, frankly, a pretty, I mean, it looks bad, but it's sort of obvious what it is. And here's what happens if I scale down just green. And you'll notice that in both cases, I see pixelation. In the first one, I see pixelation in the red area. In the second one, I see pixelation in a heavily green area. But also notice that here, I mean, yellow does contain some green. I, I do see more pixelation here. As far as what I actually see and care about, I do see more pixelation, even in bluish areas, um, th than I would in the other image. So even though I'm scaling, I'm actually keeping more detail in this image, I, I think that the perceived difference is, um, the perceived quality is actually higher in the first one. So I want to change coordinates to a coordinate system that better stratifies the data by human perceptive, per, per, uh, the bias of human perception. The system I'm going to choose is one that is used by JPEG. It's used by, certainly by streaming video, um, uh, and it's called YCBCR. But you are going to keep seeing this system referred to as YUV. And the reason is because of funny historical stuff. So YCBCR is a format for digital color representation. YUV is a format used by analog systems. It's the same format pretty much. Um, they're not really equivalent because one of them is analog, one of them is digital. YUV and YCBCR are sort of the, analog, the digital and analog versions of each other. Um, if you ever see YUV in the context of digital images, they're talking about YCBCR. So I'm just going to keep saying YCBCR to be technically correct, but a lot of uh, sources basically just call it YUV. So what this does is it separates the image out into three color planes, just like before. But you'll notice from the way that these, these look sort of like negative images, you'll notice that what I end up with, I have this, this one plane called Y, which is luminance. And it is an attempt to um, duplicate human perception of brightness. So we took the original RGB image and we rotated around the coordinates in such a way that this, the Y plane, basically ends up being an idealized, in terms of human perception, grayscale version of the image. It turns out that converting a color image to grayscale is actually not trivial. It's not as easy as averaging the colors because the human um, visual system perceives certain colors different than others. So we actually have to use a more complicated um, transformation to do this. We'll see it in a minute. 
Uh, but uh, the Y plane is luminance. So it's meant just to be brightness. And what's interesting is that because of the way our visual system perceives things, the green information is also sort of contained in this. There's a huge amount of data about the green channel also perceived inside of the luminance channel because we have such a bias to the way that we see brightness based on green detail. CB and CR represent, in a sense, sort of differential views of the amount, how much of each pixel is blue compared to how bright it is, and how much of each pixel is red compared to how bright it is. So in a sense, and I, I mean this very loosely, CB and CR are um, differences that give you, that you can use to recover the amount of blue and red in the image from the luminance channel. So here's, oh, actually a new, a new test image to work with. So the reason that we use YCBCR is, is explicitly because it was designed to enable easier subsampling. It, it was designed so that we can, we now have the most important thing that we see is the detail of brightness. That's the Y channel. These two, we can now subsample at will. Unlike this previous case where in an image that's full of green, subsampling green or subsampling red and blue makes sense, but an image that's not full of green, it's hard to know what to subsample, although subsampling red and blue still seems to be sort of helpful. Here, we have explicitly put all of what we think are details into the Y channel, regardless of the color composition of the image. Um, and so because human, our human perception is so biased towards luminance, which is the term I'm going to keep using for brightness, um, and movement, although for images we don't care about movement, for video we will, um, we can now, you know, hack away at these color components without having as much of an impact on quality, regardless of what colors actually are contained in the image, because the detail in the image, the brightness, is being encapsulated in the Y channel in any case. So how do I go from RGB to YCBCR? Um, it's an affine transformation, so it, it turns out that you get the Y channel just by taking this combination of red, green, and blue. So not averaging them. A lot of people think you can convert an image to grayscale by averaging the components, and that does it mathematically, but not in terms of what humans actually see. And it turns out that um, for the actual coefficients used in this formula are actually up for debate. There are a few different ideas of how best to convert it. I'm going to use this one that's used by JPEG. There are There is some agreement about coefficients to use in certain settings, and JPEG uses this one for the sake of having a, a point of reference. Notice that to compute brightness, the brightness of the image, the luminance, is predominantly, a majority of the luminance is the green channel. I use very little red and even less blue. Almost none of the blue goes into how my brain perceives the brightness of this image. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why subsampling blue earlier didn't seem to do much damage to the image. So here, and I'll show the rest of the formula in a minute. Um, the, the value of luminance is the perceived ideal grayscale value based on what we understand about human vision. So the, the real, I don't know what ideal means in general, but the real ideal, independent of the bias of vision, I suppose in terms of wavelengths or something, in terms of how much information is retained, I, the ideal grayscale would just maybe be an average of red, green, and blue, but not in terms of how humans see it. Um, in particular, the human visuals. Okay, so you can tell maybe I rearranged my slides a bit. I think we've already seen this part slide. I'll leave it in when I post it because I, I can't be bothered. Um, so uh, as a result, if you actually use image processing software to convert an image to grayscale, you very likely will see um, that uh, the image processing software just converts to Y. If you want a grayscale image, it converts to YCBCR and then takes Y. It doesn't do something else. The ideal grayscale value is, is the result of what's called desaturation, which is usually the result of doing a different coordinate transformation and then, and then um, removing all color information from it. So the conversion that I use and that you're, you ought to use in a course like this, I think, um, for assignment four, you actually get a choice, but the code I provide does this. The conversion I'm going to use is this. So Y is this combination of red, green, and blue. And then you can see CB and CR are, um, first off, they're normalized so that they uh, would otherwise be negative because they're meant to be a difference between Y and color components. Uh, for our purposes and for JPEG's purposes, we add 128 to it, which means that CB and CR will never actually be negative values. So it is supposed to be a positive or negative value, but we've shifted it up by 128 so that it can fit in an unsigned 8-bit um, value. 
Um, so uh, the inverse of this, so here's YCB and CR, and then here's the red, green, and blue components. Uh, here's the inverse. Notice how we get uh, red by taking the, the luminance and then using CR to adjust the luminance value because CR represents a sort of difference between the red component and the luminance. Same thing for um, CB. I, 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 take, I get blue back by taking Y and then modifying it based on CB. Interestingly, green is recovered from all three components. It's recovered from Y and some differential based on CR and CB. Okay, so here's the subsampled RGB image we saw earlier um, where I've reduced the resolution of the red and blue components to 20% in, in both dimensions. So that is to say, green still has this number of pixels, whereas red and blue probably have about this number of pixels. Um, actually, maybe a bit less than that number of pixels each. So that's how much I've scaled it down, and we notice that that's a pretty significant amount of scaling. Um, and so it's not not the quality is not too shabby, but but we can see some artifacts. There's some artifacts. There's some artifacts. There's some artifacts. That that stem of this one leaf, which we've noticed has caused us trouble in the past, definitely has some artifacts. Um, so here. Uh, yeah, okay. Here is the result of subsampling YCBCR. So there's the RGB subsampled image, and I've, subs I've kept one color plane at full resolution, and the other two have gone down to 1 25th of their, other, of their previous resolution, scaling down by 20 to 20% of its resolution in both dimensions. There's RGB. Here's YCBCR. I did the same subsampling. I just subsampled the CB and CR planes instead of the, instead of the red and blue. And I think that the difference is absolutely obvious. We can see plenty of artifacts here. We can see very few artifacts here, even though the same artifacts exist. We've done exactly the same scaling. The difference is we've pushed the detail, we've pushed the change in information into something that humans see less. If I had to pick a place where there were artifacts, I would say down here at the bottom of the pair. Um, and you can see there is some evidence of some sort of jagged thing happening there. Um, and if you went looking for it, you would find it. it. It's not that it's it's not necessarily, and there's some down here too, it's not necessarily um, very well hidden if you know where to look. The argument I would make is, if I just show you this photograph without circling anything, and I show you this one, you would agree this one is way worse. Uh, and so we found a way of relegating um, some of the details to these other color planes, and then we can butcher those color planes all we want. And the Y plane preserves so much detail that regardless of the, of the image, as we'll see in a minute, um, we still get to preserve a lot of the detail of the original image. Um, so uh, since uh, we're performing image compression starting from a, a full resolution um, image source, so if I hand you a PNG image that's in RGB uh, and that's full resolution, so we've assumed it's not already been compressed, you can always just convert it to YCBCR yourself or to any other system. There are plenty of other systems that exist. And then you downscale um, two of the color planes, the CB and CR planes, and then your decompressor could then upscale them, so just, just um, uh, increase their resolution, and then sandwich them back together into RGB. And as I said, we can do whatever transformation we want. There's no reason we have to use YCBCR. There's just a lot of reasons why it's a, it's a sensible coordinate system to use for this sort of thing. Uh, and it's what JPEG uses. And we'll see that for our quality comparisons that we talk about at, at the very end of the course, we tend to do quality comparisons in terms of YCBCR for the same reason that we use it for compression, which is that it tends to, it tends to be a better way of splitting up data uh, in, in line with human perceptive, uh, perception biases. So the reason that we've, I have to, there's a bunch of funny historical terminology stuff I have to get at here, which is, um, the term that we're using, subsampling, doesn't really describe what I'm doing here. I mean, I have these three color planes, Y, C, B, and C, R, and I'm scaling two of them down. I have them at full resolution, and I'm scaling them down. And in the context of my compression, I have them at full resolution. You gave me a full resolution source image, and I scaled it down. So what is the word subsampling supposed to mean? Um, it refers to the fact that and maybe it comes from old analog equipment or something, it's still done, but it comes from the fact that the way we would do subsampling in video capture or an image capture, including on, on the physical sensor that's used to capture the image, is we actually have sensors for the different types of um, uh, data we're acquiring, so brightness versus color, and subsampling in this context meant literally just don't capture as many pixels of color data. 
So do less sampling, basically. So what that might mean is um, you have, you have the, here's a little area of your, well, if I'm gonna draw a diagram, I'll draw it bigger. Here's a little area of the sensor on a, on a um, that's detecting light for image acquisition. And you've got four sensors for luminance here. So you've got two by two luminance. You might only have in this corner down here one sensor for let's say the CB channel and down here you have one sensor for the CR channel. So you are subsampling. You are taking fewer samples of those two things. Notice also that for some reason the sensors for blue and red aren't lined up. They're in different places. This can result in an apparent increase in detail because you're getting a little bit, the, the information you're getting is slightly offset, which means maybe you're getting more spatial information which you can reconstruct later. The key is the term subsampling comes from the idea of how the image data might have been acquired. Um, and that doesn't make much sense. We use the term subsampling mostly as a throwback to that. So if you watch streaming video or TV or digital TV or whatever, uh, in, whether it be high definition or not, almost certainly you are seeing this kind of subsampling, which is a very odd, this, uh, this ratio approach. So I believe if you keep the image at full resolution, you are doing 4, 4, 4 subsampling. 4 and then um, if you do 4, 2, 2, you are keeping the image at its full resolution in one channel and the color data is being subsampled but only in one dimension. So for example, the horizontal um, resolution is half but the vertical resolution is full. 420, for our purposes at least, it, it's complicated. 420 probably describes something closer to this where on one line you are capturing two Y values and let's say the CB value. And on the next line you are capturing two Y values and just the CR value. So what, what you ultimately still have though is you've got CB and CR at one quarter the total number of pixels as Y. Now the way we computed that was by downscaling, but there are ways of doing it in a funny offset manner. You could do that too. You might actually get quality improvements if you can handle that correctly. But for our purposes, we can just say, let's scale the two channels horizontally and vertically. So 420 would be that the two color channels are in 50% resolution, both horizontally and vertically. Um, we don't, you're not testing on whether you know what this old ratio style representation actually means, but I am gonna keep saying 420 subsampling, and that means that we keep the, um, two chroma channels, are CB and CR, in one quarter the total number of pixels. So half the vertical resolution, half the horizontal resolution as the luminance channel. Um, we could subsample more, but generally we only subsample by half um, for, broad, for, for most streaming video and for things like JPEG images. Now, the way we're going to do this is you have a full resolution image, which means you get Y and you get CB and you get CR at full resolution. And when I, for, the, for our purposes to do this 420 subsampling, what I would do is I would say keep Y at its full two, but for this particular case, break the image up into blocks that are two by two, keep Y at its full resolution. For CB, you have this two by two block, average the values of the block into one pixel, okay? And then for CR, do the same thing. Average the entire two by two block. Now you've got one quarter of the number of CB and CR pixels as you do Y pixels. For our purposes, that'll be sufficient for subsampling. Now there are reasons why you could do a biased subsample where instead of just averaging both of them, you do something like this. You instead say, look, compute a sort of weighted average where this contributes a little bit less, these two contribute less and this contributes more, whereas over here, reverse it. So. Uh, and the idea there is that the weird biased subsampling might result in you retaining more information about the image if you know how to recover it. That's fine too, but for our purposes, taking an average is absolutely fine to reduce the resolution. And then to upscale, what you would do is you would, if you had a fully averaged pixel, so you've got one pixel where there previously would fo were four, to upscale, all you have to do is, to, um, con is just to ex double the number of pixels. And then this turns into four pixels of, with the same value. Okay, so there's the fruit, the fruit bowl with uh, RGB subsampled, and we've, we've taken uh, the red and blue channels to one-tenth of their previous horizontal and vertical resolution. Got lots of pixelation, especially in heavily red areas here. Here is the same thing, but I've subsampled in YCBCR. And I've really gone to town with the subsampling. What I was just talking about, 420, the standard subsampling regime, is cutting the resolution in half in both dimensions. Here I'm cutting it down to one-tenth 
So I'm, I'm really reducing it by comparison. Um, and so lots of pixelation, lots of obvious artifacts in the RGB version, same amount of information in the YCBCR version, and there it is. And I'm noticing, yep, still some pixelation, but it's way higher detail. This piece of melon is actually looks like a piece of melon again. Um, and a lot of the other places I was seeing pixelation, less severe pixelation, like over here and over here and some of this area, actually now look quite a bit better with some still happening over there. So um, by using YCBCR, by preserving that detail in the Y channel, which incorporates mostly the green, but also the other colors from the original image, I am able to preserve more subjective detail. Um, <clears throat> now on this next set, I just noticed this before doing this, um, this little green border, just ignore that. That's, that's an artifact caused by the program I was using, not by the subsampling method. So that's just ignore that. That's just it's a bug in the code. Um, here I've subsampled this grapefruit uh, using RGB subsampling. Notice really obvious like staircase-like artifacts there. Um, and here's the same thing subsampled with YCBCR. So there are still artifacts uh, in the, in the subsampled version. These ones are really visible, but there are also some artifacts in the RGB version happening up here on the boundary between the bright region and the edge of the grapefruit. Um, if I look at the YCBCR subsampled version, notice that the artifacts over here are a little bit more visible. Now there are ways of, of combating this by being more clever about how you compute averages. If you notice that you're on the edge of a white region, for example, you could prioritize the color data for the, the other side of the region. Um, if we just compute a straight average, which is what this is doing, we get this kind of artifact. I think subjectively this is way less noticeable. If we look at these two together, we are, I can see a lot more detail being preserved. If you look at the detail the, of the sort of pulp of the grapefruit here, it's way more obvious in the YCBCR version, even though it's the same amount of information than in this version where it looks very blurry and there's really obvious discoloration, blocky yellowish and purplish discoloration happening all over the place and this fully pixelated region here. Whereas I get pretty high detail, the pixelation is gone, there are still some color artifacts, but I, I get the full detail of the image in this case. Um, and then uh, here's this again, subsampled, and then here's this subsampled with YCBCR. Oh, and that's the end. Uh, and that's the end of the lecture. Uh, so what I want to talk about next time, we've, we now have enough that we can begin talking about what it is that JPEG does after this. JPEG starts with subsampling. Pretty tasteful subsampling, though. Not nearly as bad as this. It usually only subsamples each color plane by half. So it, 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 we end up with the Y layer being kept at full resolution and the CB layer being kept, and the CR layers being kept at half resolution in both dimensions. Which, of course, it, given, you know, this example where we're scaling down by 10 and we're still getting in good detail, you can imagine that there, there are generally not many noticeable artifacts if we only scale down by one half. Once JPEG has all three of those color planes, um, then it applies a number of other transformations, and then it runs the result through a, a, a pretty typical, although convoluted, lossless encoding pipeline by using differential compression and then um, a Huffman code. So we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Hopefully this lecture is pretty refreshing. It's good to look at images of grapefruit. The next lecture will be um, will be one of those less uh, refreshing ones. So um, go go grab yourself a snack, grab yourself a nice fruit salad, and then you can settle in for the next one.